Hi everyone, this is Lisa Davis with another Catholic MomCast, which I'm going to start out as I often do with the words, When I was a little girl. When I was a little girl, we lived just close enough to both sets of our grandparents to visit each a couple times a year. My dad's parents lived in Baltimore, Maryland. My mother's parents lived in rural North Carolina. And for a good number of years, we lived pretty close to halfway in between in Norfolk, Virginia, a few hours from both. My grandmothers were as opposite as two women could be, and their homes were just as opposite, so visiting each of them was a unique treat. My mother's parents lived about five hours away from us in a little white house in the woods of North Carolina, a family home that went back to the 19th century. A big screened-in porch stretched across the front of the house in our younger days, furnished with a row of gray-painted rocking chairs, a long metal glider, and plenty of side tables just in reach to put your glass of sweet tea. The yard was full of trees dripping Spanish moss. We spent a lot of time rocking on that porch, swatting flies, and many a hot summer afternoon playing in the crepe myrtle trees. My grandmother's kitchen was paneled in pine seasoned over the years to a warm buttered toast patina. White ruffled curtains hung at the windows. My grandmother always had a Courier and Ives calendar hanging on the wall and a silver percolator plugged in on the counter. The big old gas cook stove in the corner had fried so many egg and bacon breakfasts we imagined it might have been able to do it all by itself, except for we kids couldn't imagine that stove without our grandmother leaning over it. My mother's mother was a tiny woman, not more than a smidge over five foot tall, a pretty woman until the day she died, with beautiful doe-brown eyes and snowy white hair. She was practical, graceful, and quiet in voice and manner, a contrast to my grandfather, who was a giant of a man, six foot four, and broad shoulders, fair to freckling, balding, and blue-eyed. A retired coastie, he was what you might call a good old boy, in all the good senses of that distinction more a talker than my grandmother, but not flashy. He always had a twinkle in his eye, at least for us grandkids. His name was John, her name was Mamie, and their tender devotion to one another was a thing of beauty we recognized even as kids. John took good care of his Mamie. During one of my last conversations with my grandfather, when I was about 18 years old, he assured me that he had quite a large savings account set aside to be certain that she would want for nothing if he died before she did. In that same conversation, he advised that I should never settle for a husband who would not do likewise. That was a man's job. He took care of his wife. And Mamie took care of her husband. Every morning, before anyone else was stirring in the house, we would hear my grandmother's scuff slippers tread softly across the living room. There would be a pause and the quiet noises of her working in the kitchen the tap running, then the sound of her padding back to bed, followed by the low murmur of our grandparents' voices and the sound of the percolator swishing and kagunking in the kitchen. It's a warm, comforting exercise remembering this ritual. I can almost smell the coffee and feel the sense of safety and security that also filled that little house in the woods. And you know what I think? I think part and parcel of this snuggly memory is that there is no background drama that comes with it. It was what it was. I don't expect it ever crossed my grandmother's mind to question that she had to be the one to get up and make the coffee, or cook the meals, or make the beds. She loved her husband, she loved her family, and it was her honor and pleasure to take care of them. And we knew this. She was not put upon. She didn't wish she were somewhere else. Her vocation was as natural as breathing, and grounded in pure and simple, plain old love. Generations of women through the centuries understood the important role of women in the universe, unencumbered by the foolish propaganda of modernism and feminism. And my grandmother modeled that contentment in duty for our whole family, for my mother, for us grandchildren, and now it's filtered down to our children, her great-grandchildren, she helped build a dynasty of happy homemakers. Not that every moment of every day is sunshine and roses for the happy homemakers amongst us, mind you. Of course not. Not for my grandmother and not for me either. Our lives have not been perfect, not by a long shot. 
Each generation has history of missteps, failures, and character flaws. I own that I've goofed up on more things I can bear to contemplate. But the big picture, the duty and love of motherhood, as it was passed down to me, was grace-filled and purposeful by the grace of God, and formed the memories that became my world view and fashioned my expectations for my own family life. It was a beautiful, comforting, duty-filled world that my grandmother chose to build for her family, an ideal that she passed down to her children, and one that I inherited and tried to reproduce for my children, probably with more purposeful intent than my grandmother had to. She still operated on the fumes of a rightly ordered societal mindset that the current generation has to start from scratch to recreate. Now, I feel like I'm painting a picture of a mirage, but it really was almost like stepping into a Norman Rockwell painting visiting our North Carolina grandparents. Here's a little more of what I remember, because these things should be remembered. Several of us grandchildren, there were seven in our family, Hearing our grandparents up with the sun would run and join them in their big four-poster bed, then compete to add our two cents to their gentle discussion, while the smell of coffee wafted in from the kitchen. Mom, we called her Mom, the name I chose for my grandchildren to call me too, would get up after a little bit and bring back a cup of coffee for Pop-Pop, which is what we called him. And we would talk and giggle until the morning sunlight brightened the room enough to catch Mom Mom's attention. Knowing our mom and dad would be up soon, she'd shoo us out so she could dress. Then she'd go out to the kitchen to start the breakfast. Bacon and eggs, usually, and her famous cat head biscuits. And we'll link to the recipe for those in the show notes. And she'd brew another pot of coffee before the morning was through. The grown-ups would be stirring their second cups and talking around the kitchen table as we headed out to play in the trees, the smell of bacon and coffee lingering on our clothes. Life wasn't perfect. This would have been in the 1960s and 70s, and you may know what the world was like then. Similar to the world today, Vatican II was in full swing. Hippies were rioting. There were shootings. Things were pretty much chaos. But it didn't touch us. It really didn't. We were clueless. Because our parents and grandparents and our schools and all the other adults in our lives made sure it didn't touch us. And that's the other side of this picture postcard. The world looked beautiful to us. It was beautiful to us because that was still a priority to most people for children in general. Childhood innocence was protected. We were protected by most of the world. One way that the chaos of the 21st century is so much more vile and alarming we can no longer take for granted that everyone wants the best for our children. But the world has never been without danger. As we grew older and the world imposed itself, our parents introduced concepts carefully stressing the Catholic morality that countered the evil. When it became necessary, they warned us the best they could about the dangers that they thought most likely to threaten us. We knew about bad words, for instance, and why good people didn't use them and that image of manure in my mouth has never left me. We knew not to talk to strangers. We were never allowed to go inside any friend's house without our parents' express permission. We never touched the television on switch without mom or dad's okay, and there were very few television programs that we were allowed to watch. Same thing with books. I got into trouble when I was 12 years old for getting my hands on a copy of Dracula and reading out the Renfield parts to my little sister. Sorry, Nina. Don't let your kids read Dracula, you guys. Classic lit or not, it's totally nightmare material and has many murky occult twistings that I had no business reading, and I wish I had not. Suffice it to say that books, of course, should be as carefully monitored as any other media, expanded to include smartphones and computer use and the careful monitoring of pop music. My parents' cautions are all common-sense rules that still apply 40 years later and then some, because you may be the only one trying to protect your child. Our society as a whole no longer even makes an attempt. That Norman Rockwell-style world of my childhood and our children's childhood happened because it was surrounded by well-fortified security fencing, especially when we were very small. Unlike the movie The Village, have you seen that one? There's a lot of fodder for contemplation in that movie. But unlike those characters in the village, who were completely sheltered from the modern world, 
Our parents made us appropriately aware of dangers, but protected us from near occasions. As we grew older, we were at least somewhat prepared to live in the world without being part of it. Something that is still possible and vital to do, not just for our children, but for ourselves. Someone commented on a recent podcast, a phrase that I love, create the world you want to live in. I love this because it says so succinctly what we really do have to do. It doesn't matter what your upbringing was or what your situation is now, whether you're a parent or a grandparent, a single person or a religious, it's your job to create as beautiful and as godly a life as you can on purpose. None of us should expect a Norman Rockwell world to unfold around us as a birthright. It's a special grace if your parents work to create a safe and godly space for you. But so what if they didn't? There's no reason you can't create that properly ordered space, that Catholic culture for yourself and your family. There is still a lot of good out in the modern day world. But here's the thing. Most of what you find that's good is nothing new but was well known by your grandparents and great-grandparents all the way back as far as you want to go, because all that is truly good is rooted in God and godliness, and a lot of it is found in the pleasures that crowd close to hearth and home. The Church has always taught this. The Ten Commandments, the precepts of the Church, the Catechism, the traditions of the liturgical year, all support this idea of a safe and holy home. When you decide to build a life held snug and close to heaven by the arms of prayer and the love of duty, you discover the uselessness of worldly enticements and the beauty of things as prosaic as teaching your child how to pull out weeds instead of strawberries, having one grandchild interpret for you the chatter of another grandchild, singing together while you clean the kitchen, changing the oil in your car with your dad, washing the dirt off your hands after a day's hard work, enjoying a cup of coffee with a loved one in the morning, or a well-earned glass of wine in the evening when the kids are finally tucked into bed, then kneeling down at the end of the day to tick off a long list of God blesses. Ordinary moments, not flashy or exciting, not something you'll see on TikTok, but timeless and beautiful and precious, because when what you're doing is not worldly, it's heavenly, and it can make ripples that carry goodness down through generations and around the globe. You really can create the world you want to live in. For best results, make it a holy world. <laughs>